Now, here's your host. Thank you. I'm Larry Patton, and I'm your host for today. And we have a very interesting guest to start off our show, and he is Kurt Daniel, and he is with the Carolina Cardi Cardiology Cornerstone. And Dr. Daniel, I, I fumbled through that, but I'm not going to fumble through the DO, so you tell me what That's that is. That's fine. I'm a doctor of osteopathic medicine. Thank you very much for having me, Mr. Patton. Well, we're, we're delighted to have, have you, and Larry's good. Thank you very much. I appreciate, appreciate being called Larry. You know, uh, health care appears to have gone from the country doctor to an army of specialists. Would that be a fairly accurate statement? Well, yes and no. Um, medicine has become more and more specialized as it has become more and more complex. But I think still the bastion of health care is a good central primary care physician mm -hmm. who can organize the more complicated um, parts of health care that are performed by the specialists in the interest of the patient's overall mm -hmm. health. You know, I, and I always feel comfortable going to someone who is specializing in the thing that's giving me problems at the time. That makes me feel fairly, fairly comfortable. So I'm not finding fault with it. I think that's a great thing. Uh, interventional cardiology. Yes, I sir. would assume all cardiology treatment is, con is uh, interventional. Not necessarily, no. Um, I think the most important aspect of cardiology is preventing disease from happening. Mm. So there are many, many cardiologists, in fact, okay. the majority of cardiologists who focus on medical treatments and lifestyle changes and really advice to patients for how to have better health. Those people are called general cardiologists, and they make up the majority of cardiologists. A smaller group of cardiologists may work on electrical parts of the heart or on special imaging mm -hmm. uh, parts of the heart, but interventional cardiology, which is what I do, is um, focused on using tiny devices that we insert through the arteries of the arms or legs mm -hmm. to try to improve the body's health uh, by using these little devices. This may mean for patients with coronary artery disease, of course that can cause heart attacks or chest pains, that may mean using tiny little balloons to perform angioplasty to the arteries of the heart or putting stents in to hold those arteries open. For people with uh, bad blood flow to their legs, it may mean doing angioplasty or stenting there to restore that blood flow. Mm -hmm. For people who are born with heart defects, holes in the heart, if you will, we can use tiny devices now to repair those without cutting the chest open. Um, and even in some cases for patients who have diseases of their heart valves, we can sometimes repair those with minimally invasive uh, procedures that are much easier on the patients than uh, surgeries have been in the past. And those are good things to hear for people who have those problems. I know I have a son who's dealing with a heart valve problem. and. It's comforting to dad to know that people are specializing in that. Now, in that you have specialized treatment, and that's your arena of operation, uh, I would assume there has to be special training as well that may not be true of everybody. It's quite a lot of training. You know, uh, after college, there's, of course, four years of medical school. Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to practice cardiology first has to have complete training in internal medicine first. That's another three years. Uh, so every cardiologist is an internist. For general cardiology, next, it's another three years of general cardiology training. If you want to specialize in interventional cardiology, it's another one or two years after that. So mm -hmm. it uh, comes up to at least 11 years after a college of training to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've, I've been referred by uh, practitioners, medical practitioners, to specialists. What determines that process? How does that happen? Well, it depends on what kind of problems you're having. There are many problems that may relate to the heart that a primary care or a general internist uh, type physician are perfectly comfortable handling. Problems like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, the majority of the management of those problems um, happens by primary care physicians. Uh, mm -hmm. And even some situations of heart disease like heart failure can be managed by primary care doctors. But more complicated heart disease and, and disease that maybe requires a more sophisticated diagnosis or a more sophisticated treatment might need a cardiologist. Mm -hmm. Now, people don't just call your office uh, and say, I want an appointment. They are referred to you by their family doctor? Generally, but, but it varies somewhat. There are some people who um, have problems that they know about that they would prefer to be seen by me um, primarily. And uh, if uh, 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 that's all right with their primary doctor, that's fine. And mm -hmm. uh, I do receive some, some uh, patients in my clinic who simply call and wish to be seen, and that's mm -hmm. fine. 
And you do have a website, and that website is GMKTG, GMKTG at uh, Triad. Actually, no, our, our uh, website is www.cornerstonehealth.com. I like that better. Cornerstone Health is all one word, no spaces, no dots, no dashes. I like that better than the one I have here. <laughs> okay. Uh, the risk, the risk, risk factor, uh, you know, by golly, it just seems like everybody's at risk for a heart attack anymore. Well, it, it's, uh, that's not entirely untrue. Uh, some of the most important risk factors for, for heart disease are things we can't do anything about. Aging is one of the most potent ones. Right. The older you get, the more at risk you are for having something bad no, don't go there. to you. <laughs> go, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. <laughs> but, uh, but there are other ones, and of course things like uh, your gender, males more than females, your ethnicity, and mm -hmm. your genetics are things we can't change. But there are a number of elements of risk um, mm -hmm. that a person can change or a person can change with the help of their doctor. Lifestyle is very important, and you, were, you and I were talking earlier about stress and yes. trying to have a good, uh, calm quality of life. Eating right is very important, mm -hmm. avoiding uh, cholesterol and avoiding refined starches and refined uh, sugars that we've learned about. Um, avoiding smoking is critically important. Most folks think about smoking as being a risk factor for lung disease, mm -hmm. but um, it's very common for smoking to cause heart disease or mm -hmm. disease of the blood vessels to the legs. And having an active lifestyle where you exercise regularly is also very important. Mm -hmm. Now, risk factors that we think about as requiring a doctor to help might be things like diabetes or high blood pressure or high cholesterol. And certainly, um, everybody as they age should uh, think about those things and talk with their primary doctor to be sure they're doing everything they can do to prevent heart disease. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, you diagnose uh, whether or not a person has heart disease, and uh, that's a pretty touchy situation. We talked about stress, and sometimes we self-diagnose heart problems when we don't have them, but you have methods by which you do diagnose. Yeah, that's true. The most important thing, though, uh, is low-tech. I think the most important thing is talking with the patient. Mm -hmm. The most important clues about the diagnosis, in my experience, come from what the patient tells me. Um, after that, of course, the stethoscope is very important mm -hmm. for listening to the heart, and we can pick up a lot of clues that way. Um, but many times, uh, there are other tests that are required. These can be tests like EKGs, which are electrical tracings that show us what the heart is doing. Imaging tests like echocardiograms, which are mm -hmm. ultrasound beams that we bounce off of the heart, which give us an awful lot of information about its function. Mm -hmm. And then CAT scans, MRI scans, and in some cases, angiograms, where we need to uh, put a catheter in the body and inject dye to see the, uh, the heart or the arteries. Mm -hmm. is sometimes necessary. Yeah, and I've had them all. <laughs> but they tell me I'm doing great. Isn't that nice? I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Once you diagnose, what are the treat treatments that are common? The most common treatments that I do are angioplasty and stenting of the heart and of the peripheral vessels. And I do um, about 10 cases a week at this point, mm. or around four or 500 a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the outcome of people who have interventional tra uh, treatment can vary from what to what? Um, in general, the, the treatment outcomes are very good. Um, most patients who have symptoms from their coronary artery disease, particularly angina, in most cases we can make the symptoms go away completely or significantly improve them. Um, uh, the, sim the same is true for people with disease of the arteries of the legs. But my job isn't done after I fix that. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, we really focus on what we call secondary prevention. And that means preventing a second problem in people who already have a problem with their blood flow. Um, so that's really uh, a very important part of what every interventional cardiologist does. Mm -hmm. the, you know, uh, we hear every once in a while on television uh, and via the newspaper uh, these breakthroughs. And it always brings a, a real sense of excitement to the medical uh, community anyway. Yeah. Uh, anything happening today that is really making you optimistic? Oh, yes. Well, you know, interventional cardiology is one of the most active areas of research and development in all of medicine, and there are always new things coming along. The thing I probably am most excited about right now are developments that make these procedures that I do easier for my mm -hmm. patients. Uh, for example, um, we have uh, been doing almost all of our coronary procedures <clears throat> through the radial artery and the wrist okay. rather than the femoral artery and the groin. Um, by using the artery and the groin, you know, uh, we have to hold pressure over that area for some time and the patients have to lie still and flat for four to six hours at times. Right. Many patients complain about that as being very uncomfortable. Um, 
but by using the artery in the wrist, we can simply put a bracelet over the wrist. The patient can sit up immediately after the procedure or even walk uh, as soon as the sedatives wear off. And of course, uh, because these procedures are more and more comfortable, many of my patients are requesting no sedatives so that they can watch what I'm doing. It's oh, kind wow. of interesting for them. Wow. I did watch, by the way, and I thought it was the most phenomenal thing I ever saw. Uh, I'm not asking to come down and rehearse again, but <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> what advice do you give to a heart patient? Um, do everything that you can to live a good, healthy life. Mm -hmm. Don't smoke. If you do smoke, do everything you can to quit, including talking to your doctor, <clears throat> utilizing the community resources that are available to you. Um, eat well. Avoid fatty meats. Uh, get most of your calories from lean meats and vegetables. <coughs> Pardon me. No problem. We have some um, water there if you'd like to take a break. Try to exercise as much as you can. Um, even taking a, a 20 or 30 minute walk three to five times a week mm -hmm. will strengthen your heart and improve its overall health. Mm. And that, that, I think that's excellent advice. And uh, having practiced it, I know that it does tremendous good. Uh, recently, they had a large telethon f to raise money for cancer research. And a lot of very important people became involved in that. And of course, everybody's waiting for the day when they say, we found the cure to cancer. And that'll be a glorious day. Yes. Will there be a day when we say we found the cure to heart disease? Um. I think it's possible. Um, in fact, there are some treatments that are being studied now that have actually been shown to make plaque shrink inside mm -hmm. of the arteries. We can't wow. make it disappear yet, um, but we may be able to make it shrink. And indeed, you know, the medicines and treatments and uh, recommendations that we're giving now uh, have really reduced the incidence of coronary mm -hmm. disease uh, events over the past decade. And, you know, it used to be very much the leading uh, killer in this country, but really, Heart disease has been waning and cancer um, has been Increasing, catching up, yeah. if you will, um, in, in those uh, statistics. So we've been doing very well at reducing heart disease. Um, again, the, the things that we need to do are working on primary prevention, meaning preventing mm -hmm. anybody from having a first episode of any kind of heart trouble by focusing very carefully on those risk factors, mm -hmm. and then preventing any regression, or sorry, preventing progression of heart disease in people who have it. Mm. Wow, that's good information. Dr. Daniel, we appreciate you coming, and we invite you to come back at any time. This is good information, and I trust you listen very carefully and that you'll visit the website and get more information because this could be helpful to you. We'll be right back.